A mysterious African man, most likely hailing from Mozambique, arrived on Japanese shores in 1579, serving as the bodyguard of an Italian Jesuit named Alessandro Valignano. The young but influential missionary was determined to deliver Christianity across the Far East on the orders of the Catholic Church. As the Jesuit and his bodyguard walked through the streets of many Japanese ports, crowds would gather to stare at the unusual pair of foreigners. Valignano's great height clearly distinguished him from the local population, but not nearly as much as the dark-skinned man in high-class Portuguese clothes who stood by his side. This man, who would become known as Yasuke, was one of the first black men that the people of Japan had ever seen. Unbeknownst to him, his time in Japan would see him through the adventure of a lifetime in the service of a powerful military commander. Yasuke's unlikely exploits would wind up placing him in the history books as the one and only black samurai, the first foreigner to ever be granted the title. But where did Yasuke truly come from, and how did he come to be in the service of Alessandro Valignano? Much of his early life is shrouded in mystery, and his exact age upon arrival in Japan is unknown, though he was by all accounts in his prime. The prevailing historical narrative is that Yasuke was taken from his home during the slave trade and brought to India. From there, the Jesuits may have purchased him as any other slave, but Thomas Lockley, the author of a research paper on the life of Yasuke, as well as a companion biography, challenges the claim that Yasuke was still enslaved by the time he reached Japan. Lockley asserts that Yasuke may have earned his freedom as an indentured mercenary on the Indian subcontinent and found his way into the Jesuits' employ from there. While this claim is somewhat contentious among historians, we should also acknowledge that Alessandro Valignano was no mere parish priest. He was a leading strategist in the Jesuits' sacred mission. Bearing the appointed title of visitor, Valignano had jurisdiction over most of the missions throughout Asia and had his sights set on Japan in particular. If it were true that Yasuke served the visitor while still in bondage to him, he would still have been a valuable asset to the Jesuits. And this is evidenced by the fact that he was taught some of the Japanese language before being brought into the country. Given the discriminatory attitudes of most Europeans toward Africans at the time, any and all privileges that Yasuke might have obtained in Valignano's service were likely bestowed upon him due to a combination of his own loyalty and strength as a bodyguard. Priests like Valignano did not generally surround themselves with soldiers, but this was more of a matter of keeping up a peaceful appearance. In truth, valets such as Yusuke were often skilled with weapons and more than capable of holding their own in defense of their pacifist-leaning Christian employers. This job description does support the idea that Yusuke had a warrior's background well before he had any involvement with the war between Japan's feudal lords, and his attested feats were certainly impressive. An excerpt from the Shinko Koki describes the black monk as being well-built and having the strength of over ten men. While the details of their personal relationship are unknown, Valignano obviously thought Yasuke to be a sufficient protector for his trip to the capital of Japan in March 1581. But before we can get into the fateful meeting that changed the course of Yasuke's life, it's essential to explore the state of foreign relations in Japan during the Sengoku era. Before Japan's long period of isolation, the island nation openly traded with nations as far away as Europe. This period was known as the Nanban Trade. Nanban being the word that the native Japanese used to describe certain groups of foreigners hailing from the southern regions of Asia. New trade routes were established to Portugal, with merchants and missionaries bringing all manner of western wonders into the market. The legendary warlord Oda Nobunaga had an affinity for foreign curiosities, especially those that could be useful to him in his war to unify all the warring states of Japan. His adoption of matchlock firearms in 1549 had already begun to revolutionize the way battles were fought across Japan. While most military leaders in Japan saw these weapons brought by the Portuguese as unreliable due to slow reload times, Nobunaga circumvented those downsides by mass-producing the guns so his soldiers could carry multiple and replace them after every shot. His novel tactics turned these muskets from borderline useless to being able to produce continuous fire in actual warfare. Nobunaga had done what no commander in Japan had done before, and may have even been one of the first men in the world to make use of firearms in such an efficient manner. This was especially true as Japanese metalworking techniques made the guns forged in his country more consistent and powerful than those in Europe at the time. In 1581, this brilliant military mind was headed to the capital area of Japan at the same time as the Jesuit visitor Alessandro Valignano and his African bodyguard Yasuke. Somehow, fate had conspired to bring the most ambitious warlord of the Sengoku period and the first black man in Japan together in a close encounter that would make history. 
By the time Nobunaga arrived in the capital, the streets were already bustling with activity and enormous crowds were being drawn in by some never-before-seen spectacle. The source of this commotion was none other than Yasuke, whose powerful build and skin tone had captured the attention of the Japanese. The people had never seen a man who looked quite like him, and rumors spread quickly throughout the capital. The sheer numbers that Yasuke drew in were enough to cause riots as members of the crowd trampled over each other just to get a glimpse of the new mythical man. It's been alleged in some historical accounts that buildings may have even collapsed under the weight of the number of people who had gathered in the capital to see him. There was more at play here than the mere spirit of inquiry, and in a translated letter from one of the Jesuits, Louis Freus, the attitude of the Japanese toward Yasuke was described as admiration. Perhaps Yasuke had garnered this admiration by showing off his stunning strength, as that same Jesuit letter stated the man knew some performance tricks. These might have been displays of combat skill, or more akin to those of a circus strongman, but either way, Yasuke was quickly seen as a renowned performer, and his physical fitness would impress even Oda Nobunaga. The warlord learned of Yasuke soon after the riot in the capital and immediately asked the Jesuits if he could meet the man. At the time, Yasuke had hidden himself away in a building belonging to the Jesuits after a crowd of his newly won-over fans overwhelmed him and he had to flee on horseback. Upon the request of Lord Nobunaga, the Jesuits brought Yasuke to meet with him at the Honoji Temple. Nobunaga was a curious man, and after hearing about the sensation of Yasuke's arrival, he had to know who this foreigner was. When he first laid eyes on Yasuke, Nobunaga was dumbfounded. He couldn't believe that the African man's skin color was a natural part of Yasuke's appearance, and even suggested that he might have been covered in black ink. Nobunaga's enthusiasm for new things got the better of him, and he ordered Yasuke to remove all of his clothes from his upper body. Yasuke complied, removing his outer layers and exposing more of his skin to Nobunaga and his court. The Japanese warlord's fascination with the black foreigner only grew, and he reportedly had Yasuke scrubbed all over with soap and water to verify that his complexion was natural. Once Nobunaga was satisfied with enough empirical evidence, his expression became joyful and even celebratory. The accounts of everyone present, from the Jesuits to Nobunaga's own sons, tell that the powerful man was truly surprised and impressed by Yasuke. And he wasn't the only one, as there was a deeper cultural reason as to why Yasuke's skin color would have been seen as favorable. The same charcoal black color was a color often associated with Buddhist statues, and Buddhism was by far one of the most popular religions in Japan. To witness a man with skin color of a Buddha who towered over average people and was strong beyond belief must have been an almost religious experience for the Japanese people. While Oda Nobunaga himself was remembered as something of an atheist, repeatedly breaking taboos of the Buddhist faith, such as violently invading temples in order to gain ground, he was also known to pray for victory at shrines in accordance with the teachings of Nichiren Buddhism. It's possible that Nobunaga, like many of his subjects, saw Yasuke's skin as a sign of divine blessing, but knowing his more pragmatic outlook makes this interpretation largely guesswork. What is known is that a nephew of Nobunaga was so impressed with Yasuke upon this first meeting that he gave him 10,000 Japanese coins. This momentous exchange of currency marked Yasuke's first taste of true freedom in Japan. He would come to visit Nobunaga once again in the province of Ichizen while still in the company of the Jesuits. Because he was able to speak a decent amount of Japanese, Yasuke was able to converse with Nobunaga and the two appeared to strike up a friendship almost immediately. He would leave the service of Alessandro Valignano as the missionary moved on to other lands and become a vassal of Nobunaga's realm. It was around this time that the African man acquired the name Yasuke, a Japanese-sounding name which, depending on the source, was either a corruption of the Makua name Yasufe or a portmanteau of Yao and the common Japanese male suffix Suke, meaning he was a member of the Yao people. With his new Japanese name, Yasuke was also given a private residence as well as a ceremonial katana by Nobunaga. But this show of hospitality was far from the end of Nobunaga's ambitions for the man. There was much talk throughout the region that Yasuke might soon be given the title of Lord. Given Nobunaga's knack for bringing out the potential of his followers, this prediction was not far-fetched. From the start of his illustrious military career, Oda Nobunaga had always had a sharp eye for identifying the most promising warriors of his regiments. For example, of all the Ashigaru infantrymen at his disposal, Nobunaga had chosen a peasant foot soldier named Toyotomi Hideyoshi to become his personal sandal bearer. The same Hideyoshi would prove to have such a talent for fighting and strategy that after the Battle of Okeazama, Nobunaga would appoint him as one of his most trusted retainers. Following Nobunaga's death, Toyotomi Hideyoshi would go on to complete his former lord's mission to unify all of Japan under one banner. 
There's a lot to be said about Hideyoshi's rise from peasant with no samurai background to the Supreme Chancellor of Japan, but for the purpose of this video, it's just an example of how Oda Nobunaga would elevate everyone he took a special interest in. Yasuke's unique appearance might have been what caught Nobunaga's eye to begin with, but it was the man's proficiency with weapons and his liveliness as a conversation partner that kept his lord's attention. In time and in much the same way that Toyotomi Hideyoshi was appointed Nobunaga's sandal bearer, Yasuke was made to be Nobunaga's weapon bearer. The sudden promotion made Yasuke a high-ranking retainer of Nobunaga's court and effectively a samurai. Yasuke was later given retainers of his own by Nobunaga, as was customary for any man of status at the time. But the true mettle of a samurai is decided on the battlefield, and when Oda Nobunaga made his push to defeat the Takeda clan, Yasuke marched off to war with his forces. Yasuke fought beside Nobunaga in this lengthy campaign against Takeda Katsuyori, which culminated in Nobunaga's decisive victory in the bloody battle of Tenmokuzan. As the black samurai traveled through the former Takeda lands with his leader, he came to meet the famous Tokugawa Ayasu. Alongside Oda Nobunaga and Toyotomi Hideyoshi, Ayasu is considered one of the three unifiers of Japan and would go on to become its first shogun in due time. For now, he, like Yasuke, was a vassal of the Oda clan, albeit one who quite literally made a name for himself when he founded the Tokugawa clan. Matsudaira Aitara, a retainer of Ayasu's, records the meeting between his lord and Yasuke in his journal, mentioning Yasuke by name. This same journal entry also lists an exact height for Yasuke. He was 6 feet and 2 inches tall and must have dwarfed the average Japanese person. His impressive stature, coupled with his known ability to perform feats of strength, made it almost expected that he would participate in one of Japan's oldest sporting competitions, sumo. In a museum in Osaka, there exists a historic Japanese wind wall, or byobu, with an illustration that features a sumo match between a Japanese wrestler and his opponent who has noticeably much darker skin. For this and other reasons we'll discuss, the black sumo wrestler is generally believed to be an artistic depiction of Yasuke. In the drawing, his sumo match is happening in the presence of a distinguished samurai lord who bears a slight resemblance to Oda Nobunaga. Being an enjoyer of sumo was another of Nobunaga's well-known characteristics, and from 1570 to 1581, the warlord threw grand tournaments where any man could put his wrestling skills to the test. The time frame within which these sumo tournaments took place does overlap with the start of Yasuke's service to Nobunaga. Given how highly the lord thought of the black samurai's physical strength, it makes sense that Yasuke would have been allowed and encouraged to take part in the ongoing matches. The drawing itself was done in 1605, many years after Nobunaga's death, but it's heartening to think that Yasuke and Nobunaga would be the subject of such an art piece long after the time they spent together. There was more to their friendship than sumo, as Nobunaga invited the black samurai to dine with him on at least one occasion. This was a great honor that feudal lords of Japan offered to only a select few of their vassals. Oda Nobunaga was no exception in regards to the exclusivity of his dinner invitations. The notion that he trusted Yasuke so completely as to have dinner with him was an indication that their bond had only grown closer since their first meeting. It's likely that Nobunaga learned many extraordinary facts about the world outside of Japan in his conversations with Yasuke. The warlord never crossed the seas to visit other countries in his lifetime, but perhaps through the eyes of his well-traveled African retainer, he was able to vicariously imagine more of the curious sights that could have awaited him. These talks must have been equally awe-inspiring from Yasuke's perspective, as the luxury and power afforded to the samurai was far beyond anything he might have known in his service of the Jesuits. Had Yasuke's service to Nobunaga lasted longer, the black samurai might have been granted further privileges befitting of his noble titles, like Ayasu and Hideyoshi before him, but in 1582 his chance to rise through the ranks of the samurai and become a true lord were crushed, along with Nobunaga's own dream to unify Japan. In June of that year, Akechi Mitsuhide, one of Nobunaga's generals and another bodyguard turned samurai, betrayed the trust of his lord and moved 13,000 Oda clan troops on Hanoji Temple, where Nobunaga lay completely vulnerable. This turnabout was so sudden that even the soldiers in Mitsuhide's command likely didn't know the full truth of whose army they were fighting. Tokugawa Ayasu, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and the rest of Nobunaga's generals were busy fighting battles on other fronts during this attack. Nobunaga had almost no forces to bring to bear against the traitor Mitsuhide. There were only about 150 trained men at his disposal, including Yasuke. It's said that Nobunaga's loyal attendant, Mori Ranmaru, took up a bow and arrow in the battle alongside his brothers, despite having never been a warrior. The young men did not survive the day, 
and Honoji burned as Nobunaga and his remaining soldiers fought to their dying breaths. Akechi's much larger army took the temple easily, despite its fortifications, and Nobunaga was grievously wounded with a spear that was thrown by the enemy troops. He reportedly told the court ladies and other non-combatants to flee to safety before enclosing himself in the back room of the palace. There, with Yasuke by his side, Nobunaga committed seppuku in the ritual fashion of the samurai. Because Yasuke was Nobunaga's personal weapon bearer and was present for these fleeting moments, it's speculated the black samurai might have served as a kaisha kunin, a trusted second person who delivers the killing blow during seppuku. Whatever the truth of the matter was, Yasuke fled the temple following the death of his lord. After the battle, Akechi Mitsuhide sought to confirm his victory over Nobunaga, and he searched the burnt-out ruins of Honoji for his enemy's head. Much to his frustration, Mitsuhide did not find it, and it's alleged by some historians that Yasuke carried it with him later that day when he went to join up with the army of Oda Nobutada, Nobunaga's son. Nobutada learned of Mitsuhide's betrayal and his father's death, and was advised by one of the other samurai, Murai Sadakatsu, to make his way to the Nijo Castle in Kyoto. There, Nobutada gathered all of the available forces that were still loyal to Nobunaga's cause. Yasuke made his way to Nijo Castle as well and was present for Nobutada's war council. All non-combatants were sent elsewhere until only the samurai remained in the fortified castle. Akechi Mitsuhide still had the overwhelming advantage in numbers and mobility, and because he was aware of this, Nobutada chose to bunker down within Nijo Castle and command his forces to hold it as long as they could. Another letter from Louis Freus states that Yasuke fought and defended the castle but was captured later in the day and forced to surrender his sword. Facing inevitable defeat, Oda Nobutada committed seppuku as well, instructing his own kaisha kunin, Kamata Shinsuke, to hide his remains so that Mitsuhide would not find them. Most of the vassals gathered at Nijo Castle were killed, including Murai Sadakatsu, and others were forced to commit seppuku, but Yasuke was spared this fate by Akechi Mitsuhide. This apparently was not a gesture of kindness on the part of Mitsuhide, who supposedly made racist statements about Yasuke, saying that he was not Japanese and therefore nothing more than an animal. Following the Battle of Nijo Castle, Yasuke was escorted back to the Nanban Temple, where the Jesuits recognized him and took him in. Louis Freus said the Jesuits were quite relieved to see Yasuke alive and well after all this time. Any further information about his life beyond this point is extremely scarce, and no further Jesuit letters mention him. Because of the death of Oda Nobunaga and the actions of Akechi Mitsuhide, Yasuke had for all intents and purposes been stripped of his rank as samurai. For all we know, he might have continued to live freely in Japan or purchased a ride on a boat and returned to his homeland. It's most likely he faded into the background of history, but one account of the Battle of Yamazaki tells a different, more glorious story. The Battle of Yamazaki took place only 13 days after the betrayal and slaughter of Hononji and was set in motion as soon as Toyotomi Hideyoshi intercepted a letter from Akichi Mitsuhide's forces that revealed the traitor's plans to send his forces after Hideyoshi next. The peasant-born samurai lord Toyotomo Hideyoshi led the forces of the Oda clan against Mitsuhide, and over the course of his decisive battle, was able to avenge Nobunaga and secure his position as his former lord's successor. A great many of Nobunaga's former allies participated in this fight to defeat Akechi Mitsuhide, and it's even said that manning one of the cannons for the Oda clan on that side of the battle was a man with a quote, coal complexion. This man might have been the black samurai who out of loyalty to his fallen lord left the Jesuits and sought out the banner of Hideyoshi, another of Nobunaga's long shots, in order to provide his prowess in battle against the traitorous enemy that had struck down his friend and leader. Because there are no mentions of Yasuke's name in any record of the battle, there has been no way for historians to confirm if this particular Oda gunner was really Yasuke. Sources do indicate that other foreigners served in Japan's civil wars during and after the reign of the Oda clan, but Yasuke was the first and only one to be granted his right to a sword by one of the premier warlords of the time. Regardless of whether Yasuke was present at the Battle of Yamazaki, his legacy and close bond with Nobunaga left an indelible mark on world history and will forever be known as the only black samurai. Now check out What If Kamikaze Pilot Survived or watch this video instead.